What you're about to see is a video that I created in 2019. Once the Monty Python Flying Circus box set came out from Network, I knew right away that I wanted to do some sort of video about it because it was amazing. But, as I've said other places, I never got a chance to finish it. And so, uh, now I went back and I looked at that footage. And there's a lot of stuff in there I simply just didn't want to re-record. But I wanted to do it all over again in terms of using the footage that existed. And since then, talk to some people to figure out other pieces of uh, information that I could add to it to make it maybe just a little bit better. So you're going to see an amalgamation of footage that I shot in 2019 as well as stuff I shot in 2020. But the main thing is that I'm using this to celebrate one of the great box sets of British television to be released, which is the Network's uh, Monty Python Flying Circus Blu-ray set, which I want to share with you all now, and I hope you enjoy. Monty Python's Flying Circus has been found to be an effective tool in the offending of the easily offended. So if you're one of them, do us both a favor and don't watch. Thank you and God bless. recognize different types of trees from quite a long way away. Number one, the larch. <laughs> the larch. The larch. And welcome to From the Archive, a British television vlog. I'm Throat Wobbler Mangrove, and one of the things I wanted to talk about for a long time and was waiting for for a very, very long time, was a decent set of episodes of Monty Python's Flying Circus. You know what I mean? You know, on DVD, home media, something else. It always seemed like something would get released, but it never actually ended up being as nice as you would want it to be. It's very, it was very frustrating, actually. I think I got into Monty Python's Flying Circus a little bit later in life. I was probably about... 13 or 14 years old, which I consider to be actually just the right age to kind of get into that kind of humor. I was uh, going to Catholic school at the time, and uh, I was, what, middle school is what we would call it here. And uh, most people, I think, would have seen Monty Python's Flying Circus on PBS. But I distinctly remember when I started watching British television shows on PBS, such as Butterflies, Brass, uh, Faulty Towers, Doctor Who, of course. I don't know if PBS stations were calling back Monty Python or our PBS station in particular was just done with the, with the licensing of the program because I remember, and I think I still have some of the promos on some of my old Doctor Who movie version tapes back from the you know early, mid-80s, was... They did this thing, um, a marathon of episodes called the Monty Pythonathon. And what that was, of course, was kind of a marathon of episodes, kind of saying goodbye to the show. And I don't know if it became maybe too expensive for them to run or just the fact they didn't want to run it anymore at all. It, it, I really don't know what happened. But the thing was, though, that... I missed out. I didn't get to see it on PBS, which I think a lot of uh, uh, folks in the U.S. saw because it was around for quite some time. Where did I see it then? Well, I saw it on MTV, the music music television channel, and I thought it was really interesting. I kind of came across it one night. That warning that we showed at the beginning of this was basically them saying, look out, here comes Monty Python, and it was really unique actually to see that because one of the things that I found interesting thinking back to it was the fact that uh, there wasn't any commercials in it in my mind that would be uncut and we're gonna find out that that doesn't mean uncut at all uh, based on what we find out about this release but at the time for a commercial station had no commercials for Monty Python they ran the entire thing and took up a 30-minute block 
I thought that was really unique and really interesting, and I loved the humor. It was, it was you know, alternative humor for a guy who was in Catholic school and uh, would tell his friends, like, oh my gosh, you got to watch this show on MTV. Some of them did, some of them didn't, but it was really fun. It was a fun time. It was like finding out something new, and I'd be very interested to know other people's experience with being introduced to Monty Python's Flying Circuits for the first time. And I know that there is a number of UK viewers who watch what we do here. And I'm sure there's a number of you who have watched it live on broadcast uh, when it originally went out. And if you have memories of that, I would love to know what that is because I find that really, really fascinating. And it's, it's such a great show that uh, I think it just has a ton of memories for everybody. One of the things that I did very early on, as as we're going to get into more of these uh, vlogs, it doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be Blu-ray reviews and stuff. It might touch on some subjects I find very interesting, such as videotape trading and just video recording. I think recording episodes of anything off air for your own private library it was always something I loved. And I started that at a very early age. And Python on MTV was really no exception. But with stuff like Doctor Who and other things that I was recording at the time, there was uh, those were going to be scotch tapes that I, I love to record stuff on. For some reason, and I don't know why they even existed, uh, we got, my family, got a bunch of what we call uh, Le Click tapes. And they're, it's just a brand, and kind of an off-brand. We got these Le Click tapes, and... The outer casing of these Le Click tapes were different colors, and they were pastel colors, of course. But I made sure, for some reason, I wanted to make sure that I recorded those Python episodes onto the green Le Click tapes. They looked like this, and it was really very, uh, uh, very 80s, I guess, based on the colors that were available. There were in the U.S. Uh, one, I think, one. Uh, studio that put out uh, videotapes of Python. I think that might have been HBO, to be honest. And I think they did like two episodes of tape or something ridiculous like that. I remember getting them from the uh, video store. I'm sure I didn't record them for myself because that would not be the kosher thing to do. So I recorded them for myself. I did. I dubbed them, of course. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a way to kind of put together, cobble together a collection of, of whatnot. I'm not going to go through the history of Monty Python on home video. In fact, when we get to this little number, we're not going to go too deeply into this. This is a very abridged version of looking at this tonight because the hope here, first of all, I have not made it completely through this set. And you'll, you'll understand why. If you have, good for you. You have absolutely a ton of time on your hands. This takes time to go through. Why does it take time to go through? Because not only do you have Blu-rays of episodes of Monty Python's Flying Circus, but each set comes with a mammoth book by Andrew Pixley. You know, one of the things about... Uh, when we get to this set and why I want to do this tonight is because I, I wanted to show off the quality. I mean, I, I put in disc one and I was blown away by what I saw. Standard definition videotape on Blu-ray and I was I watched it on a 65-inch uh, 4K television, which obviously is actually outputting it to uh, 1920 by 1080. But the thing was, is I was immediately hit by how crisp and beautiful that two-inch videotape is. And I decided I really needed to, before the end of the year, because I don't have a lot of time to do a bunch of these at the moment, but I wanted to at least get one more episode out here that started to show the quality and why this is such a special set. But I also wanted to show why this is kind of a pain in the ass also and some of the pitfalls that network has created by creating this set but that's we're going to get to that in a second i'm i'm no expert in monty python's flying circus i'm going to be the first to admit it i love the series but up until probably about five six years ago i didn't quite realize that there was you know a lot of patchwork that needed to be done to for us to be able to see this series you know as it was broadcast. I had no idea. I, th I was pretty sure what I was watching on these sets 
basically was going to be the whole show. And there's a lot of bits and pieces that went into this to make this what what we have here. So there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be able to tell us how this was put together or what was missing before we were able to uh, get this all back together. And I am not one of them. But my hope is that in 2020 that I'm going to be able to take some time and uh, actually do another one of these episodes that really goes into depth what was taken out, what was, where did stuff come from. And the reason why I say that, uh, one of the things that I found very exciting leading up to the release of this set was uh, Paul Venesis, who is project consultant on this, uh, on this uh, set. And basically, leading up to the release of this wonderful Blu-ray Blu set, he was showing us uh, pictures of two-inch videotape and other pieces of film and stuff, telling us that these are essential pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, to put back into these episodes. And of course, I find that very fascinating and, and really exciting. First of all, a picture of two-inch videotape, for some reason, is just, you know, I just love it. It blows my mind. It's just the, the idea of this piece of archival history is on these videotapes. Yes, please. I enjoy that quite a bit. But then on my Twitter feed, I posted one of the pictures or, or something about Python, and I think I tagged Paul on it. And uh, somebody asked and, and replied, including Paul on it, asking, is there a list somewhere of where all the assets came from to come together to restore and remake this? And Paul said that there wasn't one yet, but he thought he could get to something in December. And I'm, you know, I'm sure whenever, if it's January or whatever. And I'm hoping to to use that as a basis to kind of also go over some of the stuff that uh, really makes this the essential set to Monty Python's Flying Circus. I've also asked Paul to uh, see if he'd be interested in being interviewed for my podcast which is from the Archive of British Television podcast. And the thing is, is uh, I, I, have, you know, I don't know if he's going to be able to, I don't know if he wants to, but I really hope he does, because I think the whole idea of a discussion, maybe not necessarily about the series itself, but the restoration and the patchwork and the love and care that went into making this is, to me, super important. It should be documented if not with me, with someone. So I'm hoping that he takes me up on that offer. I'd love to talk to him in January about it because uh, the work that has been done, and he's going to be the first to say he's not the one that did it all, uh, but it sounds like he did a lot of the tracking down and he had a lot of people helping him. That is the stuff that uh, I really would like to uh, talk with him about and hopefully hopefully that'll happen fingers crossed right normally I don't say who we're going to be talking to on a podcast before I get it figured out because I don't want to end up with them not doing it and uh, and being kind of embarrassed about it but this time I definitely wanted to kind of throw it out there because hopefully seeing my love and affection for the work that they did hopefully would uh, help sway him to decide to do this for me. So we'll see what happens and, and kind of go from there, I guess. So with the purpose of this uh, video, not necessarily being an in-depth video like the last two I've done, we're not going to show anything from Radio Times or anything like that this time, though obviously covered extensively during its time there. And once we do a larger expanded version of this, uh, we'll include some stuff to fill it out more. Um, we're going to put this very heavy box set over here for the moment because we're going to talk about a couple other sets. So first off, uh, Monty Python's Flying Circus on DVD goes a far way back. In fact, uh, the uh, best of volume one, if I'm not mistaken, was released by the BBC in the UK in 1999. It was part of the first set of DVDs ever released by the BBC in the UK. Amongst them, of course, was a special edition of The Five Doctors. So this was, you know, one of their premier titles that they put onto DVD. Now for the US market, what you had, remember if you watched the episode we did on the Avengers, we talked about A&E releasing the Avengers in the US. And 
they did the very same thing with a lot of other properties. They did it a lot with uh, Jerry Anderson's series also. But another series that they did this with was Monty Python's Flying Circus. And they released that. Now hold on here. This big, massive, unnecessarily big box set. Uh, first of all, it wasn't released this way to begin with. How it was released was just like the Avengers. If you see every two set here, that was how these were released in, in multiples of uh, two DVDs per set, each in their own case. So you can imagine, you know, this is a massive set. This is a huge set. Uh, what's interesting about it also is that this set is 20 years old. Okay, not 20. It's close, though. It's 19 years old. I mean, it sounds stupid, but it's like, has DVD been around that long? Absolutely it has. We've been talking about it since 95 and 96. Uh, the idea, I mean, I remember my first DVD ever was uh, Dr. No and one of the Avengers sets as it happens. So this has been around for a long time. This is the incomplete series of Monty Python's Flying Circus, the original box set, and 5,000 volumes, it looks like at least, and uh, it's, it's 20 years old. And this doesn't belong to me. And I've been holding on to this set in my possession for 20 years or 19 years. Uh, the person who this belongs to, I think he had it for a month and kindly decided to lend it to me because I wanted to watch it. It's it's nearly 20 years and I still have it. Uh, this is your cue to understand, don't lend me anything because even 20... I've moved this box set uh, three times. I moved three times since I got a hold of this. I, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and I never watched it. I know, ridiculous, right? Absolutely ridiculous. So where does that leave us? That was in 1999, or 2000, excuse me. The BBC one was 1999. In 2005, 2006, uh, A&E was taking all their properties and they were uh, compiling it, making mega sets of everything. I have that for Thunderbirds. I have it for all sorts of releases. They did it with Captain Scarlet. They put it in one one piece and they were really kind of tidying up their collection so they released this version of uh monty python's flying circus this is my set i do own this and i've actually watched it so um this is interesting because this encompasses more discs discs than the other one that we just showed but it's 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 taking on some uh of the kind of ancillary pieces that were not uh, part of the original box set. So in this uh, first set, you're going to have uh, Live at the Hollywood Bowl, which I've been watching, or sorry, I've been reading some uh, notes on, I think it was Rhubarbs, talking about how, you know, all that you really have is a pretty poor copy NTSC uh, version of the Ho Live at the Hollywood Bowl, but a better copy was recorded using a very, uh, very experimental form of recording. And I tried to look it up prior to recording this because I wanted to talk about it a little bit more. But I'm sorry, if you've ever been on Rhubarbs and you try to use the search function, there's only one man on there who can use a search function, and that's not me. So hopefully by the time that we do a, maybe a larger, expansive version of this, uh, that maybe I could talk a little bit more about it, but also it's it's on rhubarbs. If you're a member, you should. If you're not, you should join. It's it's actually really quite nice. Um, there is also this is uh, has of course live at the Hollywood Bowl, which we talked about. This also has live at Aspen, and then you go on to the second set that uh, has some more stuff on it. The parrot sketch not included. This was. Uh, a special HBO, I think, that uh, they created this kind of special where they got everyone together. It was, uh, this was hosted by uh, Steve Martin. It had all the Pythons back together again, but only 
irreverently in one scene when he just opens the door to a closet and they're all just sitting in there which is frustrating but really funny at the same time it was also the last time we saw graham chapman uh with the rest of the pythons before he passed away it's a very interesting piece and you could see that he was a very ill man during that and then this also has an episode of the German version of Monty Python's Flying Circus, which I'm not going to try to uh, pronounce. But what's interesting is that there was two episodes of the German version of Monty Python's Flying Circus created. Only one made it on here, and that was just uh, basically an error by uh, A&E that uh, I don't think it was intentional by any means, but... Here we go. So it's it's not everything there that uh, they needed, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, but hopefully that'll be rectified at some point. The German episodes are available. I think there's an Australian release that has the German version. We're going to talk about how the German versions affect this network set in a second. Um, but I do want to show you an atrocity because we have the A and E versions, which. Quite honestly, everyone's going to be like, well, they're ugly, they're horrible, you know, blah, blah, blah. I never found them to be that bad, actually. In fact, I've always enjoyed on the back cover. It always said, now in glorious digital DVD format, so you, the digital aficionado, can enjoy the original sketches, pops and hisses with crystal clarity. When I read that, to be honest, I found it very funny. And actually, at the time, I thought it made a lot of sense because... Python is is scratchy and the film is dirty and just a lot of pops and you know it just kind of looks like it's you know all it's like just put together in a massive workroom of dust flying because of comedy always happening and stuff I I never really expected it to be restored so this was uh this really resonated with me to be honest but then we get to uh, the the other attempt in the UK to do uh, Monty Python. How do I say this politely? I hate this set. How's that? Does that kind of kind of set the tone very well? This was exciting when we heard this was coming out. This is uh, released by Sony, and I believe this was released in uh, 2007, if if I'm not mistaken. And on it, it has Before the Flying Circus, Monty Python, Cockers of America, uh, Animated Gilliam, and then po uh, Politically Incorrect Deleted Scene, which I think they just got from YouTube, to be honest. So, you know, I remember watching some episodes of this from this set. And first of all, I think this set is just actually just pretty ugly all around. You have, you know, you have this kind of uh, fold here, and I think that all of the uh, discs are pretty disgusting looking. They're, none of them really look that good, and um, just really cheap and crappy uh, screen grabs on these things. But the quality of the episodes, which is what really should matter the most, are also disgusting. I think it's an absolutely horrible looking uh, a DVD set and I would have preferred any day to watch this in fact I did because I just thought that this was uh, much better presented yes it was NTSC people are like well this was cut to shreds and I said no it wasn't because it isn't well it isn't in the sense of what we had available to us at the time uh, if you're gonna say that it was cut to shreds then all of these sets are cut to shreds because now it's complete so I I really thought that, you know, the, the picture quality of this set was lacking terribly. So I think we were all really excited when we were told this was coming out. And, uh, you know, I'm not. This was, this was really disappointing. And I watched it once. And I vowed never to watch it again. I took it off my shelf in anger, to be honest. Just couldn't stand it. So now let's talk about the the main feature here, right? Of course, this is the Norwegian Blu-ray edition of Monty Python's Flying Circus. It's just a funny, zany, fancy way of describing what this special edition is. 
uh, I think there's there's confusion about uh, what's available. What's what can you get now? And because uh, even when I was telling uh, people who watch this, I was telling them that the next one I was going to do was going to be this this Python release, and people kept asking me, "Is that just through network? Uh, is there a DVD version? Uh, does the DVD version come with the book?" Yes, and that it is confusing. And so from what originally was is that they wanted pre-orders for this. This was uh, basically, uh, this was uh, something you could pre-order and it wasn't really available anywhere else. And then uh, on Amazon, it started showing up that you could get Series 1 and you can get it as a, as a kind of a digipack. Looked like it also could come in a case. Um, the thing is, for those who want it, DVDs are available. You don't have to get blue. Um, you know, if you, can't, if, you have a DVD, if you have a Blu-ray player, I'd highly recommend it, of course. Uh, but it also, the... The DVDs and the Blu-rays, the single spice series singles, they are all coming with the books, but the release schedule is is quite it's far back. Meaning that you know November we get series one, but series two through four are pushed out, so you're not getting the rest of the series until just the first quarter of ends of uh, 2020. That may not matter to people because it, it. I think it turns. I don't. I don't remember if it turns out more expensive or less expensive. I actually think it was less expensive to get the box set, but some people just can't outlay the cash right away, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, first impressions when this came. Uh, I don't know what I think about the the feel of the box set. To be very honest, it feels like skin. I just don't know what it just is kind of an odd feels like a soft like pig skin or something I don't I don't know it's it's frightening so here's the thing which is funny enough there's a pig on here uh, here's the thing they wanted to be funny they wanted to be cool with uh, the releases so that's fine you know Monty Python zany they, they love to be zany so you get this box set, and it's it's heavy. It's as a heavy set. It's like Encyclopedia Britannica here. And you take the box, as you all know, you all know this now. You open it up, and it just just opens up like a zany fun box. Okay, sure, that's fine. You have all four episodes in here. As you can see right now, they are kind of. No, they're not. They're not. They're not standing very well, right? Well, that's because this was shipped from the UK to the US, and the box was obliterated. So here we have these wonderful sets, which is fine. These these made it all right, uh, but the set itself, the box itself is completely destroyed on the inside because it traveled from the UK to the US. You know, it's like, uh, this is frustrating. Is it a deal breaker for me personally? It is not. Your mileage may vary. People have every right to be annoyed by the fact that their box, even though it may not be an integral part of uh, Monty Python Flying Circus on Blu-ray for them, they paid a lot of money for it. They're, we're all collectors. See, isn't this fun? This is a fun box. It doesn't make me angry at all when I'm trying to close it. Um, put this back down here. We all want these things to be as pristine as possible. In the Avengers episode I just did, I, I talked about the, the curvature of, of the cardboard. I, if, if I was buying this in store, I would be very careful. But the thing is, just looking at it, you would have never known. Another thing that annoys me to no end, and I talked about this the last episode too, is that here I am, my hard-earned money, I'm buying these sets. I'm buying them from a UK provider, as I have for many, many, many releases 
over the years, many years. I have given Network a great deal of my money. I don't want to be told what type of video I'm going to receive. It just so happens that every single TV in my house plays PAL, plays 50i. I'm a collector. I'm a collector of PAL uh, television. I'm a collector of UK television. I'm a collector of it in its own original format. So when I purchased this from Network, and then afterwards I found out that they see where I'm from and they'll send it to me in the, in the format that uh, benefits uh, my region, that was a problem because that meant that I was getting 60i. So everything you're looking at today is 60i. And so uh, everything I'm gonna show, as it happens, Amazon now has this set. Amazon UK has this set available. And because apparently I have more money than cents, I ended up buying that set too because it's actually 50i. I want a good quality Monty Python Flying Circus release in 50i. And this was not happening. Am I am I annoyed? Can you hear the thud? <laughs> it's like dropping a house on this table. Uh the, the good news about this, though, is that I am going to, in fact, have uh, two sets of Andrew Pixley's books. So you open this up. I'm going to put these down because if they fall down, I'll probably collapse my table. Yeah, these things are heavy. These things are extremely, really durable. Even though it has uh, pig skin on the outside, uh, you know, you open it up. The design, although it confounds me at times because it's, it, uh, I'm always pointing it back the wrong way. It is, uh, they're, they're really beautiful. They're, they really stand out. They're very elegant. Uh, they're, they're just, they're befitting of what I thought the series could look like as far as, you know, the art and stuff from over the years. So I enjoy that. And you have, of course, this is from series three. You have, it comes out, and then you have all of your episodes over two discs on Blu-ray, which is Monty Python on Blu-ray. Are you kidding me? Who would have thunk it? And then, of course, you have this mammoth book. This is not one book. It's four books. This is just about series three of Monty Python's Flying Circus. And this book comes in at... Um, 175 pages. Sorry, I just got... The book had me for a second. It's... It, it blows my mind that something like this uh, could be available to us. I, I am I am I'm actually moved by it and I'm not kidding because this is a series that we love so much. What I find also very interesting is if I go over to my shelf here and I take out something like ripping yarns and why am I taking out ripping yarns that we have a booklet in here that has viewing notes by Andrew Pixley and it comes in about 23 uh, 23 pages. And at the time, I'm thinking, that's a lot. That's how lucky are we? Um, I think that the Quatermass book that uh, came with the set for uh, Quatermass and qu all these things, this one comes in at uh, 47 pages. That's amazing. That is really cool. But then, of course, you have... Uh, Monty Python and one book is 175 pages. I think uh, I, I'm we can check real fast, but I think all the books are about the same amount. So we're talking, you know, nearly 600 pages of of Monty Python uh, for the entire series that Andrew Pixley has written. You know, we thought this was amazing. This is amazing. We thought that the prisoner book was amazing. This is amazing. Uh, I, I just, I'm excited. I'm absolutely excited for this. Um, what I also, what I also like uh, about this is that 
um, when you get to episodes, like to the episodes listed in the book, uh, such as, uh, for example, the nude organist on page 125, uh, it has on here the project number, and it also has the videotape number. And why is the videotape number important? Because you can see it on the VT clock, because the VT clock is included on every episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. That means, in my mind, that this is, like, the complete episode. It has everything to it. And I find that to be... I just, I just love that. That's one of my favorite parts of this. Let's talk a little bit about extras. We're not going to get too far into it, but we can talk about uh, some of them because uh, just so you know, I wanted to kind of give an idea about how these things are uh, different. isn't on here that hasn't been included for various reasons and uh, 
it uh, could perhaps be included in other releases. I think the type of extras that were on this is kind of different, in different vein than what is uh, what we're going to be talking about here, and that might have been purposeful. I don't know, but I just wanted to still, for completeness' sake, uh, share what what I know. And I do want to thank uh, the folks over at Kaleidoscope. Uh, Chris Perry and also Rory Clark for some of the work that he's done for reconstructions and stuff that uh, that really makes this a very um, this list very interesting and I'm gonna go through it and, and show a couple things uh, first of all there is the 1974 uh, Radio Times trail for the start of series 4 my least favorite of the series but still there that's cool that exists um, the show of InVision uh, there is footage found in fact there was um, a reconstruction created that was shown at the BFI by uh, Rory Clark that uh, was able to showcase you know the original footage but also take in footage of better quality for the time they cut away for studio stuff very nice very very well done. Terry J that's typical of, of strong strain in all programs of course which is making television the target. Yeah yeah I, I think actually that's not, you know, it's not deliberate. It's not that we're deliberately going at television, but it's just that uh, the medium we happen to be working in is, is television. I think if we'd been, if we'd been writing uh, books, uh, we'd have been sort of using book forms, um, or if we'd been making records, we'd been using record forms. Um, We've done those. We have. <laughs> We've got this opera yeah. coming out. Oh, it's the opera. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> I mean, no, sorry, that's a bit of a, a yeah, bit it, quiet it, like the opera. It's just you know, to do silly things. You've got to have some sort of recognisable structure. I mean, uh, complete audio for. A different envision um, from June 12th, 1974. Uh, there is uh, excerpts from Late Night Lineup. There's two of them from the 18th of December, 1970. <clears throat> well, stay with us for an exclusive report from the heart of Python Regis. A lineup reporter, Michael Dean, was smuggled into the final recording of the series at great personal risk. So for some unbiased muckraking about the hideous malpractices of Cleese, Chapman, Idle, Gilliam, Jones and Palin, stay tuned. The present series of Monty Python's Flying Circus ended tonight, and Michael Dean was in the audience to do what he could on our behalf to try to put a stop to the sort of bad taste exampled here. How far do you think you can push comedy? I mean, there are certain things you can't joke about. I mean, you, tonight you joked about leprosy, cancer, cannibalism, mother-eating, incest, is that? On. We missed it. Mm. Mm. We think it. it. We missed it. We missed it. Right. 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 I think it was, was, when, when you say it like that, it sounds yeah. worse than if it just yeah. kind of happens like, in a sketch and someone has, says the word. And then people don't think about it beforehand. Yeah. But yeah. when you isolate yeah. it, like, I'm being serious, sorry. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> 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 sorry, I was being serious. By the way, well, I think you see it was just for a minute. Uh, there is a piece called Monty Python in France, which is very interesting. Bonjour les enfants, bonjour, je vais vous raconter une histoire. Êtes-vous bien assis Oui Alors, on peut commencer. Un beau jour. There's also uh, an installment of Telemag, uh, which has been untransmitted, that includes uh, Terry Gilliam in it, which um, is held by the BBC. And it's around, it's like around 1971 that this was, that was put together, um, which would have been really interesting. Um, it's Gilliam talking about Python and uh, has clips from the series itself, you know, at least from as far as the series had gone so far. And then uh, just stuff that uh, we just know that are in archives uh, that probably makes it even much more expensive to get to is that there's... Um, uh, some Python footage from the Huntley archive um, that m that may have just been difficult to clear or it just wasn't in their scope. I mean, there's so much in here. I cannot stress enough that it's not me complaining about the set. I just wanted to present it for people to know. I know that like Kaleidoscope just got the complete uh, studio recording for how to irritate people just the entire block of it they got it on VHS and they're currently looking through it to see if there's anything that hadn't been used in the final 
uh, the final finished piece. And if you follow Kaleidoscope on Facebook, you'll know that we've done something similar for Black Adder the Cavalier Years, where we had uh, access to the incomplete VHS studio recording of that night, which is quite quite a time capsule, I'm going to say. We've also done the same with Benny Hill, and uh, there's also the same for uh, The New Statesman. So uh, there is some very interesting things out there, um, and hopefully some of that gets included later. And now for something completely different. And I hope that this is helpful in some way, or at least if you haven't made it through or you're thinking about it or you know you're going to get it, but you just want to wait till after the holidays, that this is something that kind of whets the appetite a little bit because there is a lot of wonderful content here, obviously. And I think that, uh, that this is going to be... I mean, let me just say, I don't recall the last time that a restoration of a TV show on uh, Blu-ray or DVD eclipse that of a Doctor Who release because those are always so amazing that those that's where all those accolades come from but once I heard about this restoration once I heard about the care going into this as much as I love Doctor Who and those blu-ray sets this was what I've been waiting for all year were these episodes and um, I have absolutely positively have not been disappointed with this at all and honestly if you uh are thinking about getting this you should uh you should get this set for sure absolutely uh once again depending on where you get it from is where you're going to what you're going to get back but i will tell you that um obviously this is all um for the Blu-ray 1920 by 1080 as it should be. I think they're creating this set to cover a wide area to make sure that they had, you know, control of the distribution of, of, of Python. I have a feeling this cost a lot of money for them to make and get the rights to. This is also um, region A, B, and C. So even though I have a 60i version of the set right here, it's also region A, B, and C. It's basically region free. So I find, I find all that very interesting. Um, and as you see, what you've been seeing are the 60i clips, and they do look very, very good, don't they? I really think, even though I'm complaining that I don't have a choice, these are very wonderful restorations done and i'm looking forward to finding out more about them you know speaking of the podcast you can get episodes as always you can get them through uh, itunes you can, the rss feed is here too um you know we didn't do as many podcast episodes as i would like to do but uh it was a busy year a lot of stuff going on it's actually a lot of good stuff and some not so good stuff you can uh sign up for TV Brain with Kaleidoscope, because with that, you have the access to seeing, like, what all the episodes of Monty Python that are released, and what all the clips and stuff like that. Uh, you can uh, delve into different shows and see what are the archive holdings. So I would highly recommend you give it a thought. Yeah, it costs money, and I know we live in a world where people think everything should be done for free, but there's a lot of hard work that went into these databases, and uh, they're being updated all the time. I highly recommend you give it a shot. That's www.tvbrain.info, and then uh, you can go there to see what the subscription prices are. Now, of course, if uh, you want to get a hold of me, and why wouldn't you, to be very honest? There's a number of ways to do so. You can go uh, get a hold of me through email. You can do that at feedback at fromthearchive.co.uk. My Twitter is at fromthearchive. Facebook is facebook.com backslash fromthearchive, M-N. And the blog is uh, from-the-archive.co.uk. As far as the UK sets, what we do is we put them where they belong. Welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you.